Welcome back to another hour of Sky Shower. I'm Dylan. And I'm Jesse. All right. Well, this is episode 152. Um, this evening, we will be tasting a new expression from the Glen Goyne Distillery. I don't know which one it is yet. I didn't know we were flipping for it, but uh, that's what we're doing this evening. Uh, from there, we'll uh, do our shout outs and get it together. Then our uh, restaurant review, which is old but new, I guess. Uh, it's going to be on uh, the Angry Clover is the name of the restaurant, but we have been there previously under new, uh, it was under, it's under new management now, but it used to be called McCarthy's before. And then from there, we'll do our Smarter Challenge, which is the movie review of The Wrestler. 2008. That's right. Uh, before we jump into everything, thank you to all of our uh, viewers on YouTube and Rumble. We greatly appreciate all of you, uh, as, well, uh, as well as we thank all of those who listen to us on the many different podcast platforms. Uh, we greatly appreciate all of you, all of you listeners as well. Please like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy our content. And uh, also leave some comments so that way we can, uh, like, and you know, converse with you guys, and you guys can let us know what you think about our smarter challenges or uh, about uh, about our reviews on these uh, wonderful scotches that we've been trying. So with that, let's get ready to rumble. All right, as Noah mentioned, we've got Glen Goyne, one of these two expressions from the Glen Goyne Distillery. We will be celebrating and a brief history on Glen Goyne. Uh, it is a whiskey distillery, of course, Scotland, Scotch, uh, that has been in continuous operation since it was founded in 1833. Now here's what's impressive about this week's distillery, much like last week's. Um, this, this distillery has not had to close its doors or mothball since its, uh, so to speak, inception. Um, it is just north of Glasgow in Scotland, in Scotland, but with that, it sits in a unique position where it sits on the Highland Line. So it is distilled and it is a Highland single malt scotch. However, it is actually aged on the other side of the ridge because they literally sit on the ridge in the lowlands of Scotland. Uh, it's uh, very interesting because they were founded really with illicit stills in the early 19th century, of course, heavy taxes and crazy laws uh, imposed by the government made it near, nearly impossible for any of these distilleries to operate and function profitably. So most of them operated illicitly. However, uh, shortly thereafter, they passed the Excise Act of 1823 in which at which point some of the distilleries finally started becoming legitimate businesses of which Glen Goyne did itself in 1833. Um, it is operation and all they have one wash still, two spirit stills, so pretty small in comparison to some of the big boys we've revisited lately. Uh, that's 1,100 liters a year as their potential output. The scotches they do produce, ages in particular, a 10 year, a 12 year, that cask strength, um, which is our other option along with that 12 year, a 15 year, a 18 year, a 21, 25, 30, and their point here is that um, their ABV does range from 40 to 57 percent. Uh, with the 12 year, we're sitting right at 43 percent. And with the cask strength, they've gone big and they are sitting right at the peak of that and beyond because it says 57.2 this one was bottled apparently at 59.2 wikipedia we need to update your page 59.2 depending on whether we fall on love or hate this evening i know noah's got a little bit about some distillery tours okay real quickly before i talk about the tours 
Uh, you mentioned that it sits on the line. So is it technically considered a Highlands because that's where it's distilled? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure because that's what I thought, but I just I, I wasn't 100. Yes. Yeah, it okay. is considered a Highlands single malt Scotch whiskey. All right. Uh, also, it's the slowest uh, distillery, right? If I they are pretty damn slow. Only putting out 1.1 million liters a year. <laughs> and they're, they, they're super green too, right? Because they use a bunch of geese poop or something <laughs> goofy like that. If I to remember. fertilize their grass. <laughs> and they also have to halt, halt production because of the geese? They do halt production in business because the geese, they give them their time to enjoy the fertile land until they launch off again, leaving a shit fest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making sure because I, I remember I was talking a little bit about these geese and stuff like that from uh our previous one that we've uh we tried okay well i guess as far as tours go um there's really only one that you should really consider and you probably <laughs> should forget about the rest the one that you should really consider doing and would probably be the most worthwhile one is the malt master experience it's 90 minutes long costs 90 great british pounds it's an in, it has an in-depth tour, and at the end, you get to create your own single malt. And this is like one of the very few places, uh, they claim it's the only place, that you can create your own single malt scotch. Um, and so that's the one I would say, like, if you're going to do any of them, you want to do that one. The other ones that they have is they have a, a tasting, it's a normal tasting, it's 45 minutes long, 25 great, uh, 25 great British pounds. You get three grams uh, as a tutor tasting, and uh, that's it there. Then they have the tour and tasting at 75 minutes long, 18 great British pounds. You only get to try two grams. Then they have the collection tour. This might be the second one you might want to try, but the collection tour and tasting is 90 minutes long. 30 Great Bridge Pounds. Uh, you get a tutor tasting of three drams from their collections. And then uh, there's also the Fine and Rare. This is, might be another one to consider. The Fine and Rare tasting. So this doesn't really include a tour, so it's just tasting. But you get the Glen Goyne 25 year and the Glen Goyne 30 year, as well as a specially selected wild card. Uh, mystery scotch and that's 45 minutes uh, long with a 50, uh, 50 great British pound price tag on that so those are your options but uh, I think number one on my list would be the malt master experience because you get to tour and get to create your own single malt so I think that sounds like the most beneficial one to me all right well it does sound like a tasty visit to Scotland. Glen Goyne is regularly referred to as the most beautiful distillery in Scotland, which I don't know. I haven't seen it with my own eyes. I've seen picture. It looked pretty great. Doesn't look as sexy as some of the Isla Scotch distilleries right on the water though, but um, it is often referred to as the most beautiful distillery in Scotland. I'm um, Glen Goyne in Brooklade. Uh, which we've had some great experiences with as of late, are the only two distilleries remaining today that use Golden Promise Barley, uh, which is low in yield but high in quality. Um, Glen Goyne Burn is the water source that flows from the nearby Dum Goyne Hill into the distillery grounds before continuing onto Loch Lomond. Um, so, Oh, once again, they all have a, a pristine water source, a prized water source that they really chase after. Um, one of the pieces here that's interesting is that Glen Goyne, unlike most or many a Scotch distillery, um, does not use peat smoke to dry their barley, but instead favors the use of warm air. So they have the slogan, the authentic taste of malt whiskey untainted by peat smoke. Untainted, what's a taint? Wow, now when it's untainted by peat smoke, probably not a goose taint, just saying. <laughs> but with that, um, we will 
proceed to the coin toss. So uh, we've got the red box 12 year and we have got what we would call the black box cast strength. I believe it's also a 12 year. Uh, Noah's gonna call this. We'll go with hate for uh, the black box cast strength and love for the 12 year. Are you ready? Sure. All right. I, we haven't had a chance to do any research because we don't know which scotch we're doing. Hate. Hate it. Hate it is. All right. Well, the 12 year is going to sit aside. Wait. It's turn. Hate it is. We are going with the Glen Going Cast Strength Limited Batch 59.2% ABV. Um, aged. Man, this is going to be good. There, there was no question on which one I was going to choose <laughs> because you had a black and gold box and you had a red box. Oh, see you once again. See <laughs> you versus Nebraska. I can't go with anything that would be Nebraska related. All right. Well, we will dig right in. Then we'll do our tasting. Um, as far as the Scotch box itself, presentation. I'm actually digging the presentation. This is I pretty do. nice. I, do dig the I like and, and it's textured. It's got a little texture on it there. Uh, the bottle itself, also very handsome. Uh, the label's textured. Uh, they do have Dumb Going Scotland extruding out of the glass, uh, as well as the Glen Going Goose on the back there. Um, now they're saying again since 1833 when they became a legitimate business but we know that they were illicit before that I'm so it. without further ado we will pop this cork make it a wood test topper the foil, and a please cork. man right <laughs> real cork and wood topper please, please, and you get a five please, out of five thousand right and it is actually pressed into the top of the foil 1833 it's not just stamped that's interesting okay 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 uh, please 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 damn blowing please don't let us down i don't know if it's wood or not yet it is real wood and it is also either etched burnt or stamped into the top the 1833 right. you can see the texture of the wood on the side yeah, yeah. and we're going for is this real cork come on glenn going you have not if it's if it's real cork right now i'm calling it five <laughs> out of five on my presentation please, please please be cork please please not press cork yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be like full oh, I think. full cork yep all right let's get a five <laughs> out of five i mean the way the design is with the black and then they have like the gold Dude, like the, in there <laughs> And then you got the real wood and how that's like pressed or burnt or whatever they did with that topper there and then the real yeah. cork. Uh, and actually the bottle is well made as well. Uh, yeah, presentation, five out of five. I mean, it's not it's not like one of the super intricate ones, but I, that's already one of my, you know, that's, it's probably gonna get 10 points out of the gate just for the color and the presentation. That is a pretty great color. It is, it, it really is. All right. Well, I'm glad you picked hate, and I'm glad it landed on hate. And I'm really excited to try this untainted scotch. I didn't know I'd been drinking tainted scotch all along. <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> off to our uh, warp speed and our tasting reviews. Cheers. Right, cheers. So the Glen Going cast strength. Limited batch. Limited batch. Number eight. <laughs> the Glen Going <laughs> batch strength. Limited batch. Number eight. Um, <laughs> is a nice expression from them. Uh, there's some really interesting things here uh, about this particular expression from Glen Going. First, I'm going to start off with the uh, presentation. I really dig it. I love how. The box is fairly solid. The it's it's black and gold. So I always have a, a, an automatic like to anything that is black and gold, anyways. Uh, but uh, the way they did the box is really interesting because I'm not. It looks like it's a black box, maybe with like uh, gold foil in there, or maybe they did it reverse. I can't really tell exactly which way it went, 
But I really enjoy, I really like the design of the box because in certain lights, it looks black. Uh, and then other times, it looks like it could be gold. And then other times, you see both the black and gold. The bottle itself is uh, is done really well. Uh, it has, I don't know if the right word would be embossed. It's embossed like with the Glen Goyne and all that stuff on the back. Uh, the labeling is nice. Uh, it's complementary to the uh, to the box as well, and 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 its own logo too. So uh, I think in the other Glen Goynes they use silver uh, for their logo as well, um, but I could be wrong with that off the top of my head. Um, so I gave that a five out of five. I really enjoyed that. The color I put here as a nice amber slash burnt orange gold, which I really enjoyed the color of this particular scotch. Uh, so that also received a five out of five. So they're nailing it out of the ballpark, but that's where it ends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I can't, I don't know which game actually has like five, uh, five periods in it or not, but. <laughs> if you had a game yeah, with five periods, it's it's uh it, it's definitely a front runner, and uh, we can say it's uh, it's a ra it's a race, right? Like a like a horse race, but that's five furlongs long. In the first furlong, awesome, it was in first place. Second furlong, awesome, it's in first place, so it's a front runner. <laughs> but here, right when we get to the middle, to the third furlong. Uh, this is where it starts to uh, slow up speed, and maybe it's uh, at this point we start seeing hints that it may not cross the finish line in first place, depending on what the other fillies might be. Um, here, uh, as far as the nose is concerned, I really like the nose still, um, but I got uh, vanilla with burnt orange honey, sweet uh, like a sweetness from bananas. As well as a hint of cinnamon, some floral notes, and oak. And I really dug it. I like the complexity of the nose. Uh, there's some nice things in there that I did enjoy. I gave it 26 out of 30, though. It's still not quite on the same level as some of these other ones that we had previously, but it's it's nice. Few scotches are. <laughs> now, as far as the palate, um, to me, it seemed like that only like a few notes maybe came out and and that's because I felt like the palate was uh, spicy to me. Uh, but here I put it's cinnamon, uh, banana with vanilla and, and biscuit. And uh, that spiciness, I think from the cinnamon kind of carries through from the beginning of the palate all the way to the end of the palate and it's overpowering probably some of the other milder or slighter hints that might be able, that might be in there. And, th and these hints might come out later on. And since we taste these as we just first open up the, uh, the bottle, it came off very spicy to me throughout the whole palate. And as we know, I'm not a huge fan of something that's like super spicy on, on my, on my palate. So, and it's not that I, I don't like cinnamon. I do like cinnamon in some of my food, uh, foods and stuff like that. I just don't want it to be overpowering. I would rather have it be complementary to the other flavors. Uh, so here I gave it a 25 out of 30. <laughs> now, once the uh, the palate is done, we enter into the, into the finish. And the finish, that's when the uh, spiciness of the cinnamon starts to... Uh, come down a little bit and you're starting to get some of these other notes and some of these other notes here uh the main other note that i picked up here is like the sweet banana and to me it's almost like enjoying a cinnamon uh banana bread uh so you have a banana bread that has like a little bit of extra cinnamon in there or something like that and after you eat that nice sweet banana bread that's all nice and warm maybe you have some butter on there and uh, that cinnamon just kind of like coats through and lingers along with the, the sweetness of the banana bread uh, for a nice finish, which I actually really enjoyed. I did enjoy this finish. Uh, and I gave it a 26 out of 30 as well for the finish. Um, so I think with that, that gives me a grand total of uh, 87 points. Uh, would I take it to a black tie affair? 
I like the box. I like the bottle. But I'm not quite sure if I think the scotch itself would hold up at a black tie affair or not, or maybe not what I would want to take with me. But as far as the box and the presentation is concerned, I say yes. But as far as the what's in the contents of the bottle itself, I am saying no. All so right. I would not take it to a black tie affair. Uh, would I take it to a game night? Yes, I think it's game night worthy here. Um, is, does it have a place on your shelf? Well, probably on my shelf, maybe not. Uh, even though, like my, I'm like one of my favorite breads out there is banana bread. I love eating banana bread. Banana bread is like one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, as long as it doesn't have nuts in them, I don't like. I don't like. I don't like having nuts in my banana bread. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that in any kind of weird sexual connotation there. Uh, but um, I'm not sure if it really has a spot on my shelf because. I think there's other things I would in that in that price range. I think you said the price range is right around ninety to a hundred dollars. Yes. Um, there's other expressions from other distilleries I would rather have on my shelf in that ninety to hundred dollar range. But is it a nice venture away from some of my norms that uh, maybe I would like to visit maybe once or uh, twice a year? Then I would say yes, maybe so. Um. Uh, overall, I like the expression from Glen Goyne. It seems really weird to give it uh, 87 points and say that there's no room on the shelf for this, but uh, that's where we're at, and uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, but I do think you should try it. I think it's, it's a worthwhile scotch. I think there's some like nice things to it. And also, possibly that cinnamon will mild out over time um, after it's been opened, and it actually might be a better scotch than what I'm than I'm reporting on right now. All right. Well, Ian McLeod is the owner of Glen Goyne Distillery. There can only be one. That's right. Uh, Ian McLeod, I have the clan McLeod. <laughs> um, you know, we talk about it being on that Highland line, so to speak, the, the Highland Ridge. Um, and I think that that's very interesting. 59.2, I think that absolutely adds a little bit to the spice. Um, I'm right there with you. Presentation, solid five. Color, man, to me, this color reminds me of... Uh, Halberry coming out of the water yeah, off the coast of Cuba in die another day. It is a nice, dark, rich amber. Uh, and it's a sexy color. I love it. Um, so five out of five for color. The nose. Uh, the nose is super interesting here. Um, the scores, I think, are may, may sound familiar as we progress. Um, I'm getting vanilla. And the closest thing I could think of is rose uh, uh, of a red rose but uh, reports i have read said it's actually elder flower uh, browned butter and gingerbread oak and banana um, but there's something that's interesting about the nose and that is that it's not as appealing as the color or the presentation um, i gave it just like you did a 26 for the palette Oh, the palate is a little not hot from the alcohol, but hot from the spice. I love that right off the bat I get oak, but then it transitions quickly to clover, pepper, and cinnamon. And I want to say it's white pepper, but it's definitely pepper. Uh, toffee, caramel, and malt. Um, finish off the palette as it transitions into the finish. I also gave the palette 25. The finish, um, as, it, as the palette finished with malt, you get, I get barley, dark brown sugar, which I think is great, and walnuts, which is interesting because <laughs> it's what you didn't like. But I actually also kind of dug that. I don't get a ton of banana bread, but I definitely get some of that biscuit. So I get walnut biscuit. Um, the finish for me, also a 26, also a grand total of 87. And I find this very interesting because I think our scores for Highland, as this is 
you know, even though it's aged in the lowlands, it's uh, distilled in the highlands. I think our scores typically for the highland scotches are right on. And the more I look at it and assess it, I think our scores vary when we get to the islands. And I think the islands have differences in whether it's peated and smoked, etc. And this is a non uh, peat smoke tainted scotch, as they said, which I think is great. I like it. Um, I'm enjoying it. I actually really do enjoy it. But to me, man, it doesn't stand out the same as some of the others. Now, also, we have been so damn spoiled lately. And that is the truth. However, uh, black tie, I would take it to a black tie. Not just because of the presentation, but because of that 59.2 ABV and being able to tell the story about how it's on the Highland Ridge and distilled in the Highlands, aged in the Lowlands, telling the story as they're drinking this, explaining that, yeah, that spice isn't actually the alcohol at 59.2% ABV, cast strength, mind you. Um, and that this isn't just a small batch number eight, but it's the cinnamon, it's the clove. It is all of the flavors in there that actually really add it. So I would take it to a black tie event because I think it's a great speaking point. And also... Most people don't go around seeing this, and it's still a good scotch. Um, game night, yes, same same points. Like, I want to talk about it. I want to pull up the map of Scotland during game night and find out where this Highland Ridge is with uh, comrades playing whatever game we might be playing. I suggest Risk, not Monopoly. Um, space on my shelf. For me, it does. And why it does is because I'm going to put it if I'm, you know, not like the presentation behind us, but if I'm going to put it on a shelf, I'm putting it right there where the lowland scotches meet the highland scotches, and I'm going by elevation until I hit the islands, and I think that that would be a lot of fun, um, but also because to me it is a really good scotch, um, so yes, it does have a place on my shelf. All right, there you have it. No place on my shelf, place on his shelf, but the same points. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't take it to Black Tie Affair, but he would. <laughs> so uh, thank you for what it's worth. I think I think we both agree, though. It's something that you should try. Yes. It's time for our shout outs. I got two shout outs. Uh, this week um, and they are quick and they are easy number one goes to Aiden Aiden thank you for making time for your dad on a day off and going to go see a movie with me it meant uh, the world to me um, to have you give me a little bit of your time because I know you're a teenager uh, and you've got so many things you can do and I appreciate you stepping out of the house and going to go see a movie with me. It literally meant the world to me. Number two goes to Noah. And I really appreciate it. Not just a birthday gift, but an early birthday gift. Um, that was really swell. And also because it was perfect. Um, and we haven't talked about this. So he's just hearing about this for the first time. I but, am. <laughs> <laughs> but it was perfect for my position in life. Um, all, all of the different things I am going through. It is a bottle of the Macallan um, 15 and uh, the double cask. And it is literally the perfect birthday gift for me. It's what I needed. And it was it was very thoughtful. I also, also know it's not cheap. So, um, But beyond that, it was just a really thoughtful. Whether or not you realize that was the perfect scotch to give me at this point right before my birthday um it was so a shout out goes to you i really appreciate it it may it means it didn't mean it means a lot to me well you're you're quite welcome like uh i knew that we both like mccallan so and we we know how i am about about gifts about gift giving and stuff like that so i i, I don't necessarily <laughs> i don't necessarily give out uh, Christmas gifts, and I don't necessarily give out birthday gifts. Um, I am more apt to give out birthday gifts than I am Christmas gifts, but it's it, it, and usually when I do them, it's not always on like the day of the birthday or whatever. It's kind of like, uh, but once again, like I, when it comes to gift giving, I don't care what time of the year it is, and this should be for everybody though, is that 
when you give a gift, it should be no strings attached, and you should be giving it out of the goodness of your heart without any expectations of getting anything back. And so uh, I think that's probably one of the, one of the reasons why I don't like to do that at Christmas time because that feels like I'm getting pigeonholed into a <laughs> corner and being told, like, I have to, like, consume and uh, and and go into debt and do other things to, like, purchase gifts for other people. And that's not – and to me that's not uh, what – giving a gift is all about. So uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm glad you feel like it was the right gift for you at the right time. Um, you know, when I, I think when it comes to when it, when it comes to giving gifts, sometimes you may not know it's the right gift at the right time for someone, but you just kind of get that feeling like, Hey, this is, the, I think I should get this gift for this person right now type of thing. So I'm glad it worked out that way. It does because uh, you and I have talked um, in the past, particularly about the McCallan and other ties, and what would Harvey do? And uh, <laughs> it, it was perfect. But here's a side question Is a pigeonhole the same as a goose taint? <laughs> Maybe. No, it's just an inch off. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. any get togethers? I have no get it together. I have no uh, shout outs this week. Uh, uh, but I do have a get it together. All right. <laughs> My get it together goes to Facebook. Okay. <laughs> and maybe it's a get it together to Facebook or maybe it's a get it together to me. I'm not really sure how this one really goes down. But in my opinion, I don't feel like I was violating any Facebook, <laughs> any Facebook rules. Uh, I've been posting for a while. As we, as you and maybe a lot of people who know me personally, I was posting. Some Dude, you post a lot of stuff. <laughs> I post a lot of stuff and a lot of it. It's conservative stuff and I haven't gotten in trouble in a long time. Uh, it's actually been a while since I've gotten in trouble from Facebook or been put in Facebook jail. But all of a sudden this, uh, on the 15th or 16th of February without any notification, they just killed my page. <laughs> like I have no access to my page. They did. They said they, uh, when I try to access my, my Facebook page now, it says that I can go and make an appeal, but there's no place for me to go make an appeal to you. Like it, it, it gives me the, this like endless loop of information that does not tell me where I can like send, uh, an appeal to somebody. And, uh, when people search for my, uh, for my name, it says, I don't, my page doesn't exist or any anymore. So, I think if you're going to wipe somebody's uh, page out, uh, it really, they should really notify you like what posting violated their so-called rules. And the only thing I've posted really lately has all been about possible election fraud or things that are going on uh, with the economy. And I think maybe the possibly the one thing that might've caused this is a video from a doctor talking about COVID-19. Yeah, dude, you can't do that. But I think you should be able to do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying you can't. Because the Supreme Court, what was it, a month ago, ruled that the Biden administration can ask that wow. the different social media platforms shut down anything that's conservative or speaks against their agenda. Well, apparently I went against their agenda because I got shot down. Clearly. And I can't get it I can't get it back. So everything that had been on that page or whatever is all gone. Um uh, However, they did allow me to make a new page, but, uh, like, you know, like all those connections are gone. It's like you I and all the sexy ladies with their only fans page. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Shut down on Instagram, make a new one. Now I'm sunny cheeks. 2.5. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just think like, if you're going to be a social, like, if you know, I, I was just sharing like you, most of the stuff is either memes or like, uh, Videos from actual doctors or uh, actual articles from like news sources. So, uh, you know, I don't think I was really like violating anything there. But, anyways, I'm going to say tell Facebook that they didn't get their act together because I think it does infringe upon freedom of speech. And uh, they are not considered a news source and they're more of a public uh, square. So, like, these, uh, some of these rules that they claim to say that they have should not. Should not be there. I know we've talked about this years ago, and it is weird because it's a free platform. It's not a paid-for platform. And I, the irony is I think that there is some weird BS that that's why they can listen to the different administrations or different political parties and make decisions that, uh, to your point, do 
go against our constitution, but with the business sense, they still have a right to it, control it. I don't. I'm not agreeing with it. I'm just saying it's real. Yeah, I get it. I, I mean, when things have been proven to be correct, it's not like they take those strikes back. Yeah. Right. They like they knock you. They throw you in Facebook jail, and then like three months later, it comes out as being true. And it's not like they don't say like, "Oops, we're sorry." It stays on your record saying like you screwed up. And like, no, I was just ahead of the curve uh, because like it, the mass media and you guys were finally forced to tell the truth. I have an idea. Maybe just a thought. Just a thought. If Trump's elected, he can pardon all the people who were thrown in Facebook jail. Right. <laughs> Uh, but here, here's a here's a bright side to all this. Possibly, <laughs> he probably it, would too. By the yeah. way, I think this is here's the one bright side to all of this uh, is that it's killed the time I spend on social media, which is actually probably a, a good thing as well. Dude, that's actually a really good thing because most people, I'm not saying you, I'm just saying a lot of people um, that spend a lot of time on social media do waste away their life and i'll tell you that in the past month there have been several nights where i spent an hour right before going to bed on social media and then the next day i was like why did i do that like it added nothing and all it actually did was take away from my rest my well-being um both physically and mentally because of the lack of rest and also the things i was seeing that i didn't need to see Restaurant review. All right, this week's restaurant review The Angry Clover, formerly McCarthy's Sports Bar and Grill. Um, it was interesting because I saw it advertised as the Angry Clover. It wasn't until you even said something about, isn't that the place we went to that was that other Irish pub? I was just trying to go to some place that would tie into our smarter challenge, which was the restaurant review of the wrestler. And I was like, Angry Clover? Yeah, some ang angry Irish guy kind of makes sounds like a wrestler. And, uh, well, it's interesting because it was a rebranding, whether it's new management, new ownership. I couldn't find the details on that, but it is literally the previous spot, somewhat redecorated, new signage on the outside of McCarthy Sports Bar and Grill. Now, uh, the Angry Clover. Um, and for me, man, I had the nachos and a beer. And their beers aren't cheap. Uh, six fifty, seven bucks. Uh, the Palisade peach did not taste fresh. It wasn't as good as the Palisade peaches I've had anywhere else in a while. Don't know if it was a dirty lime, um, but it tasted sour, not sweet. Um, for me, the environment, the parking lot, the parking lot's not terrible, but it's not great. Um, so it gets an eight. Um, the atmosphere inside, here's what's great. Here's what truly what's great. They did redecorate. Um, they changed a lot of things inside, including the bar. However, one thing they didn't change was the dust on the fans. <laughs> And Noah spotted it like an eagle seeing a mouse in a field on a starving day. So uh, you can see the fit, the photos here. Uh, they took all this time, put in all this new furniture. Looks like they painted the ceilings and the walls and left the dust on the fans. And we're not talking about little dust. We're talking about field mouse dust. See the photo. But other than that, um, the atmosphere, uh, for me, the atmosphere wasn't great. It wasn't sexy. It was a seven. Um, next, we get to the service. The service was not. So they consider themselves a high-end bar and grill. Um, I will give them that. But what that does is knock their service score down to a five because I wasn't impressed at all. I, I, it's not that I don't think they're not trying. I just think they have the wrong people in the wrong place at the wrong time. Again, I don't know if it's new management, new ownership. They are the owners. They're trying to do what they can. They're trying to make this a thriving business. They have poker nights. They have other things going on. Uh, Monday, half price wing night, some different things. Uh, Tuesday's $1 tacos. Don't know I uh, haven't tried their tacos, but the service ultimately was a five. Uh, the food, my nachos, man. So the green chili uh, and beans nachos, uh, really, I struggled to find the green chili. 
But even the menu, as I reviewed it, did say it was green chili in the beans. Um, so that's interesting. But they, they were good. Um, they the, the price wasn't bad. Um, but it wasn't outstanding. So ultimately, though, uh, the food was good. It gets an eight. And then finally, the value. Uh, here's where I struggle is because the value is a, a conglomeration of all these different things. I'm, I'm going to give the value a six uh, because the price of the beer that didn't taste right, even though the food was good and the food wasn't terribly expensive for my nachos with chicken added, uh, the few pieces of chicken they added for an extra three bucks. Uh, I believe my nachos were $16, $15, $16. The beer, uh, another $7. Ultimately, um, this restaurant is getting a 6.6 6, uh, total score for their presence. Would I take a date there? No. Would I meet a friend there? It's interesting because I don't know that it's a bad place to meet a friend, but I don't dig the setup. Um, so ultimately, I would not meet a friend there unless it was the only place that was within a reasonable range, and it's not. So a uh, friend, no, and it's absolutely not a destination. Mm. All right. Well, <laughs> I feel like the old place was better only because this is a new place and it's the same. There's same, no change. same, but different, but still there's same. no real change. All right. So I guess I'll start with the parking lot as well. I don't think it was well lit. Uh, it's not a horrible parking lot where there's like a bunch of potholes or anything in it, but also the parking lot is kind of disjointed. It goes around a curve. Um, and uh, oddly enough, like right where I parked, uh, I felt like someone could hit my car still because of like how it curves and stuff. So I wasn't really thrilled to park about the parking lot. So I gave uh, the one thing I do did like about the outside is like the the signage is well lit, and the sidewalk in front of the door well lit. The parking lot, nah, not so much. Uh, so I gave it a six. Okay. Inside, uh, obviously, the first comment I made when I walked inside <laughs> and I found you, dust. I'm like, they still have the dust on the fans. He's not kidding. It's literally the first thing. Like, no, see, they still I didn't the even dust. say, I didn't say hi to Jesse. I didn't say anything. <laughs> All I said was, I just pointed, I'm like, there's still dust on the fans. And that's when I was just like, yeah, fuck this nice room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, they did do, they did do some remodeling and they like uh, painted the ceiling uh, or it looks like they painted the ceiling. Maybe um, uh, they have like a, like the way they did the bar section of the restaurant now has like a curvature to kind of like show a breakup of like, of like where the bar is versus like where the dance floor is, which is shut down on Sunday night, probably Monday night as well. And then on there's like a third section where there looks like there's billiards. Um, Overall, the uh, the interior, I was uh, obviously, as soon as I saw the dust on the fans, I'm like, if you're going to do all this work here and you're not going to take the time to clean out the fans, uh, you don't deserve a score, a, a good score here. So I gave them a five. I, and that's probably better than what I should give them. The atmosphere. I thought it was old and stale. Like, the energy level was low. The people, like, we were trying to, like, look at, like, what taps they had and like, I don't know, it felt like, like some of the, like, I, I'm assuming that they might be more of, like, regulars there, but they seem, like, to, like, give, like, kind of, like, uh, off-putting looks, like, as if we were, like, looking at them, but when we were, we were just talking, looking at, like, what uh, taps that were, that they had, because I was asking uh, what one of them was, because I couldn't tell what it was, and so the atmosphere here, it wasn't, like, high energy, it seemed pretty low, it wasn't, like, a whole lot of people there, it could be because it was a Sunday evening, but I gave that a five as well. Uh, the food. The food is your typical bar food. Uh, and you said it's supposed to be a high-end place? That's what they list on their website. <laughs> well, someone's delusional. <laughs> because I got a uh, chicken, a buffalo chicken wrap. 
with tots. This is this does not scream high end to me. And in fact, there's other places that make a better chicken wrap than this place. This place just seems pretty standard uh, wrap. It's just like they got a tortilla and do some shit in the tortilla. Their, their website literally says the Angry Clover, formerly McCarthy's, is an upscale bar and grill in Aurora, Colorado, featuring live music and other special events. Upscale lies. <laughs> that I is, uh, I think Up, they, upscale <laughs> dust. That's fake news. Uh, fake news. I'm calling it out right there. They're fake news. Uh, so for me, I wasn't like for bar food. It's okay. It's like average bar food. If they're claiming to be upscale or whatever, <laughs> that knocks their skill down even more. Right. So uh, I'm just gonna land on a six here for them because I'm not really sure if I should give them. If they're going high, as they're saying that they're high. Uh, uh, high scale or whatever, then I'm going to drop it down to like a five or a four. But if I'm going to uh, measure it on a bar level, I'm going to give it like a seven. So I'm going to, I'm going to settle out a six here on the food and the value. The value is actually decent for my meal. I give that a seven. <laughs> your, your score is still lower than my 6.6. <laughs> I know it is. My <laughs> average score is 5.8. <laughs> This is how much I do not like this place. And, and I'm not saying, like, I hate it. Like, is it okay to go to? But I meet a friend there? Sure. I would meet a friend there uh, because, like, the friend recommended, like, hey, let's meet here. And I'd be like, fine. I can find something to eat there. I can probably find something to drink there. But it's not something I'm going to recommend to a friend to meet at. And it's definitely not a destination spot for me. Um, the only reason why I would even show up there is if a friend said, hey, I, let's go here, uh, and I really like the place. I'd be like, I, I question your judgment, but sure, I'll meet you there. Uh, would I take a, there, a, a date there? Hell effing no. I would not take a date there. It's gone downhill, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, I really don't have anything great to say about this place, and I hate doing that because it's someone's dream. Someone bought the place. They switched the name up. Uh, and I don't like to see any business fail or falter. But I do think that it needs it needs some kind of renovation there. Or it, needs, it needs some kind of something. It needs something. To clean the damn fucking like, fans. And maybe I'll give you better scores and feel better about your establishment. But if you can't clean the fans, but you fix everything else, um, yeah, it's not not worthwhile. Oh, and I didn't even, I didn't even mention the whole like uh, wait staff. Like, I... I don't know. Like, I got a weird vibe from the bartender waiter. And um, I, I probably would have given that a five. So that probably would have dropped it down more to like a 5.5 or 5.6, maybe. Uh, I don't think it's really going to adjust it that much. But um, yeah, I would say the waiting, the wait staff is like a five as well uh, from what I experienced there. Although there was one waitress, she seemed pretty busy and she seemed like she was like pretty attentive to the people on the outside, uh, long bar stool bar area thing um but she even didn't seem super friendly either but she seemed like she's on on point and really busy doing going back and forth overall yeah i'm not like i'm just gonna say i'm not i'm gonna just stick with 5.8 i don't know what to say not destination This week's Smarter Challenge uh, movie review of the 2008 American sports drama film The Wrestler, starring Mickey Rourke, uh, Marissa Tomei, and, man, Evan Lockwood, who is the estranged daughter. Marissa Tomei is the stripper. He's trying to uh, befriend, so to speak. And Mickey Rourke is a 1980s superstar wrestler trying to find his way in roughly 2008 when the movie was released. It did win, very interesting, uh, two Golden Globes, and it also was nominated for two Academy Awards, which it did not win. Um, but I will will say uh, for me I remember the first time I watched it years ago it stuck with me and that's why I wanted to make this a movie review uh, for you know any first I know you had mentioned you saw it a long time ago just like I did uh, with this re-watching of this movie anything that you would say that really uh, stands out or uh, a quick review for you well 
it, it does show someone who found stardom um, in a questionable industry to begin with. And with that, um, as time goes on, as a person agents in a, uh, in an industry like pro wrestling, um, it's almost like, uh, like if you're looking at like a pure, like work, uh, work type of atmosphere, it'd be like construction work or something like that. Like your body is going to break down at a certain point. You can't handle the, uh, uh, the phys- the physicality of it all. Uh, and like, even though you might be dedicated mentally or, or you might, uh, want to capture that, there's going to be a point that your body's not going to be able to keep up with like the demands of the job in this case of being a pro wrestler. Uh, and it's kind of tragic, uh, his story, you know, it's someone who, who, uh, reach the heights of their industry but because of the very industry that they're in, they, it's only for a short period of time and for him to try to recapture it or to even be a glimpse of his former stardom um, is kind of saddening because he's trying to cope with with that change of that part of his life and come to terms with that. It, that's, that's not for him anymore. And even the industry itself is not really what it was back in the 1980s. Uh, and then the woman that he's trying to attract is also in an industry which does not promote uh, age as well. Longevity is yeah, not a thing. Yeah, it's not long. Yeah, definitely not there either. And so that even Marissa Torme's character has to question uh, life choices and what she's doing as a as a professional stripper as she ages as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, that when someone's young and they're and they're doing stripping or maybe it's even pornography or whatever, those women can make a lot of money uh, when they have the beauty and the youth. But as they age, that, that will deteriorate and, and collapse uh, fairly quickly as well. Uh, so that, like their stories are very tragic, very much so like the Angry Clover's restaurant is very tragic. I think they all... Go one and one together. That was the point. <laughs> <laughs> Unintentionally with the restaurant, I thought it was just going to be the Angry Orchard, but I agree. Uh, but I, I, I think if you have and you found success and then you can't maintain it or just because of the factors or the outside uh, elements or uh, outside um, things that will affect the career path that you've chosen once you start to lose that stardom or or that uh that shine if you will you're going to become angry and it's going to be very depressing and that's what this movie was i i was not like like when i first saw it it didn't leave a huge impression on me other than like i want to go date a stripper (laughs) (laughs) the only impression left on me is like yeah i'm not gonna watch that movie again probably uh and uh in fact i think uh, we found out or i discovered that i didn't even watch the whole movie the last time i think i only made it like halfway through because i'm like this is like too tragic for me i like i gotta like i gotta have something that's a little bit more upbeat than this well and you're not even adding the additional um, I'm going to say fork in the road uh, or tangent that's all still encompassing of where he's got his estranged daughter that he's trying to reconnect with when he has a heart attack, which is all bullshit because he's feeling sorry for himself. And at the end of the day, she would have been better off if he had not done that. And that is literally tragic because he couldn't even make a several day commitment to her. Um, and it's not that he didn't want to try. It's just that he overcommitted. I don't think he overcommitted. I think it was ultimately he overcommitted to himself and to her because he thought he was bigger than he was. And he has no accountability, buddy. He has no accountability, buddy. That is true. But I don't think he overcommitted. <laughs> Because if you really look at his like, he said he would take her to dinner and he didn't. (laughs) That's an overcommitment. No, that's just a (laughs) failure, dude. That's overcommitting to me. Like you're you're going after something. You're trying to reconnect, and it's like I'm gonna put the plug in the outlet. I'm gonna do this, and all of a sudden, 
<laughs> it's not like he went all of a sudden, pew. Dude, it pretty much was. No, just like because he has no accountability, chick, buddy. I wanted him to be a firefighter. Has, like, <laughs> this is what I'm saying. It's yeah, This is why I don't think it's an overcommitment. Because he has like no true goal other than get drunk, fuck women, and, <laughs> and wrestle. Which he can't really wrestle anymore because he told that he has to stop because of his heart. So even at that point, he wasn't wrestling. The only thing he had going for him was that he's working on the weekends as a freaking deli guy cutting meat. So he wasn't overcommitted. What he was doing was he was being selfish and he was being unreliable and uh, and he was following his uh, his emotional uh gear of just try to be happy or get laid and not hold to a commitment that he made. It wasn't that he overcommitted. He just didn't he just didn't want to do what he did. And then when he realized after he screwed up because he got drunk and he got high that he's like, oh shit, I fucked up again. That to me is not an overcommitment. That's I think he that's made being a commitment unreliable. to his daughter that he would be there for dinner and he didn't. Yeah, and that I'm, is uh, when you don't make when you fail a commitment, you were unreliable. I think that piece you're absolutely right with. Um, but for me, like if you sell someone, you're going to make it to a dinner and you don't make it, daughter or not, you overcommitted. See, I think I guess we're our, I think I I think we're in alignment, but I think where we're kind of varying off a little bit is that. A person who has goals who are trying to set up a bunch of things and said like, oh, "I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this," because they're 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 making pro they're trying to make progress as far as like they have goals. Uh, and I'm not saying this guy isn't really trying to making goals or doing that stuff. Like his one goal, I guess, is try to reconnect with his daughter, which he would never would have done if he didn't try to f- hook up with the freaking stripper in the first place. But in any case, uh, I think. Overcommitted comes more from people who are more reliable, who then like try to do more than they can. Where this guy, I just think he's just being irresponsible. Right. It's not, it's, whether it's a friend or a job, if you are telling your boss, "Hey, don't worry, I will be there. I'm going to take you to work, or I'll be at work at eight, or I'll meet you at dinner at on Saturday at seven, whatever it is," and then you fail, that's an overcommitment. And, Especially yeah. when you have a daughter who's literally like, I don't, you just want me to take care of you. Oh, no, no, no. I'm trying to reconnect, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden you're like, let me take you to dinner. I, I get where you come back <laughs> with the uh, commitment. And yeah, I guess I, 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 I agree in a sense. But here to me, I just think he's being irresponsible. Where like another person who might be a responsible person does make too many commitments and doesn't make, it doesn't hit it. This is interesting Um, because where I see the commitment factor is because it's his daughter and he said he would be there and he wasn't. Yeah, but he just got to telling his daughter that he tried all he tried his dandest to, to forget that she even existed. So obviously he doesn't care about her. So it doesn't really matter. I don't right. see that as a true commitment. Right, and it's her choice to believe him or not. But he saying yeah, he would to believe him in the first place. I agree, but him saying he would be there was a commitment. <sighs> like if I tell you, "Hey, I'll be there next <laughs> Monday at five o'clock for dinner," and I don't show up, that was a commitment. It was a commitment. That's no different than him telling his daughter he'll meet her for dinner. Yeah, but I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> say that's an overcommitment. It's an overcommitment when you fail. <laughs> I think, I, I guess I'm just saying like overcommitment to me is like you've made too many commitments and then. Okay, I hear that. I hear that. He's and like, here to me, he I had one commitment. <laughs> I, I agree. So you're, Maybe. you're simplifying it. You're like, you're a fail. I was getting my thingy, my jigger just above, my goose taint waxed or whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah, he had one commitment to do. It wasn't like he had overcommitted and made like. 20 commitments to some, you know, to things. He had one uh, commitment. That's interesting because this is where we are seeing things different because, like, I never thought he could do it anyway. So I never him thought making, he could do it either. And, but, see, that's where I think she existed, too. Like, you're not going to do this. You're overcommitting. Like, you can't commit to this. If you can't commit to this, you're overcommitting. And she's like, okay, I'll trust you. Let's go out to dinner. Saturday works better for me. I'll see you at 5. And then, boo, boop, nope. <laughs> See, I guess that's where my difference is. Like, I get, like, I agree with you. It's not that I, I disagree. I just think you're like, if you have someone who's like, yeah, I can do this, I can do this, and they have like 
they commit to like 10 things, that would be an overcommitment. Where this guy committed to one thing, and that's not an overcommitment. I think another. That's just a total failure. I agree, but I think another area that this is interesting is personality types, personality types and whether or not you're an extrovert or introvert. And then further and further and further, one will see it as a commitment, whereas another might see it that was an overcommitment. So one sees it as a failure when one sees it as a personal attack. (laughs) And I mean that because there are different personality types where, God damn it, Jesse was five minutes late. Um, like this guy doesn't care about me versus Jesse was five minutes late. Eh, who cares? Or I'm going to be 10 minutes late. It's not that big of a deal or two hours later, hours later or whatever. Um, it's just, it is interesting, but I think the, the real reason I want to review this movie is, <laughs> um, you know, as we all go through life, this is a great movie to watch. And here's why. The Wrestler, it's easy to watch this movie and and view a stripper, Marissa Torme, that a wrestler, Mickey Rourke, is going after, and they both do great jobs with their acting, in my mind. Um, and be like, God damn, I'm glad I'm not those people. Guess what? Most of us are literally killing ourselves Day in and day out, we may, may not be stripping, we may not be wrestling, but we are doing the day, damn same thing they are, uh, killing our bodies, not growing our minds, not bettering ourselves, um, working for someone else to continue to make money until we're dead, we're, we're worthless, we can't do it, and then we're trash. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, which major corporation you may be talking about. I think many major corporations, if not all, or or at least most, absolutely view the average human as exactly that. Is I you are you're no different than a wrestler or a stripper. I'm going to use you to death, and then once you can't perform, you're out. Well, there is a truth to that because uh, slavery slavery never ended. No, it, it really didn't. Slavery we never just got ended. paid hourly as opposed to being bought. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, here, it, it just went. It went from being like a like a plantation slavery over into an economic slavery. And there's there's actually like economic reports even from back uh, during when the Civil War happened, stuff like that. That slavery would have ended anyways because what they noticed, like if you pay somebody just enough money, they'll go out and do whatever they're going to do with that money. But then they're, they're going to come back. Well, and, that's literally the point of this movie. Like, even his landlord says that. Yeah, you always tell me you'll pay your rent until I put the lock on your door, and then you have to pay it, and then you do pay it. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it literally, like we, like the elites or whoever you want to say, whatever you want to call them, <clears throat> do you see the masses as being economic slaves? I mean, even in their white papers and stuff like that, and books. Uh, like the uh, committee, uh, the committee of three hundred, the uh, conspiracy hierarchy, or behold the pale horse. Uh, uh, there's a couple other books out there as well. But they these these people say like like humans are no better than animals, uh, or the masses are no better than animals. Uh, so yeah, like we are just like the masses are considered to be economic slaves and. You do kill yourselves for a job. And honestly, like if, if that's all you do in life, most people are just part of the walking dead anyways. You wake up, you go to work, you get off of work, you eat dinner, do whatever, and you do the whole thing all over again. And then you get like maybe 20, 24 to 48 hours to, uh, to celebrate life the way you want to do it. But really it's less than that because you also have like, shit that you got to do as far as like clean your house, do your laundry, all that type of stuff. So really the actual amount of time that you have to spend on trying to truly live your life is minuscule. And that's something like uh, the founding fathers had talked about uh, way back when, when they, when they created the, uh, uh, created the United States and the founding documents, you know, most of those guys, uh, they, um, spent uh they they work they own plantations and stuff like that but they the amount of times that they work versus the amount of time they had to think and ponder and do things uh that 
thinking and pondering and doing things was much greater than actual true work time. And back in that time frame too, more people had, uh, there was a lot more small business owners and more farmers and stuff like that. Now it's more like <clears throat> buildings that are just nothing more than like cells uh, or prisons where people work to death. Sorry, I went off on a tangent. No, you're good. It's all good. But that was the basis of this premise is uh, I just want uh, us as individuals and you as our viewers to consider uh, what are you doing to make sure we don't become the things we view in this movie, a wrestler and a stripper as these terrible uh, people without potential, like how tragic it's not even that they're terrible people said it's a tragic situation yet. We all live in a very similar situation unless we're continuing to learn and grow. And are we doing anything different to get out of that tragic situation? Uh, where we are literally breaking down our bodies and souls for someone else, uh, a business, a corporation, a boss, whoever. I think you make a good point right here uh, with that statement that you just said there because I think part of this movie, when you're watching it, to not fall into the same traps as these people, um, one, they have no plan. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> I mean, literally, have the have no plan. Shit out of me. <laughs> and then, two, you have to be adaptable and learn to pivot. Because, but I think learning to be adaptable and learning to be able to pivot would also play into the fact of having a plan as well. Because once you start seeing that your current path or your current plan is not working, you have to be adaptable to make a change and then pivot on that change to make a course correction. Because he could have, with his stardom in the 1980s as a wrestler, he could have taken the time if he had a plan to foresee two, three, four, five steps into the future and then pivot and make adjustments. And if he could could have made those, if he could have been adaptable to make those uh, those uh, those pivot adjustments to uh, meet the times or to promote himself into other industries like maybe movies or whatever he could have kept that success yeah it, like I agree but that's just it is uh man we've talked about this before and I know it'll continue to be uh, advanced subjects in our future podcasts is how creativity is killed and that is the one thing that keeps people good people great well i think it's i think creativity is purposely killed agreed i think corporations kill creativity schools kill creativity <laughs> teachers kill creativity a lot of like society's uh, rules and regulations are put there to kill creativity right and i agree with most of what you said but i do think there are some teachers that are great. Like I think there Not are all. some companies yeah. that are great, but I think you're right in the masses. And that is ultimately you get people that know that walking over and using other people is the quickest way to make money, AKA slaves. Yep. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure this is where you want to go with this. That's uh, exactly where I wanted to go with this. All right. Is there anything else you want to cover? No, with it's this? done. It was meant to be a quick uh, and and really just a thought-provoking subject of think about where you are in life. I've been doing that. I know you've done it at times, if not just recently, but I've been doing it a lot recently. And it, it's really interesting to think of. <sighs> I love my paycheck. Is it and what my company does for me equivalent of what I do for my company? And, you know, we all have to answer that. Well, obviously, you know, I've been thinking about it because <laughs> I've been talking I about making, <laughs> because I've been talking about making a pivot. Right. And that's my point is I think that this is a good point. We're talking about like, hey, are we going to do things? Are we, and then also like, hey, before we go jump off a bridge or do something else, like don't overcommit. Right. You forgot your parachute. You're going to die. <laughs> um, but also, like, do you have an accountability buddy? Like, these are important, whether it's a, a, a spouse or a friend. Having an accountability buddy, but then also, like, also learning and growing and just having someone there to support each other 
in the fact that, yeah, man, we don't want to become a wrestler or a stripper for too long. I hey, I'm not like I bet you being a professional wrestler in the heyday in the prime Dude, in the eighties would, would have been a blast. Would have been a blast, but like, Slim Jims. <laughs> but looking at like what's happening now, like 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 supposedly like what happens to this guy by two thousand and eight, it's like no, no, and that's just it. The it's very it's uh it's a very depressing movie. <laughs> Probably it's real, <laughs> like so. so let me, okay. Tangent time. In this movie, he's doing all sorts of drugs to bulk up, steroids, this, that, and the other. What do the average Americans do on their way to work? Stop and get their Starbucks, caffeine, coffee, cigarettes, whatever. It is freaking no different. Like, everyone is doing it. Almost everyone is doing it to some sense. Unless you're like me half the week, and the only thing you drink after you wake up on your way to work is water. Yeah, but you drink energy drinks, so that kind of goes into that place. Right. Agreed. That's what I'm saying is I'm just I'm not stopping and spending eight bucks on a coffee I'll on my that. way to work. I'm not I didn't say you did. Yeah, I know you didn't. Uh, I'm <laughs> just saying there are those people who do. And we all look at this wrestler as like, God damn, this guy just spent a thousand dollars on drugs to bulk up and make more money being a wrestler. And yet I know people who spend eight dollars a day on Starbucks. What's eight times 30? That's 240. What else do they do that they're not considering that is the equivalent of that to get them through a day um, to, to feel energy or this or that and the other? And I have nothing against coffee. I don't drink a ton of it. I love my Diet Coke, so, right? And I do drink energy drinks um, from time to time, but I love my Diet Cokes. I'm no different from that standpoint, but I am acknowledging it. It's like, okay, what am I really doing to make a difference, so... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, everyone has their vices. At the end of the day, we're all either the wrestler or the stripper unless we are controlling the wrestler or the stripper. That is the bottom line. And if you can't see that, it's not meant to be an attack. It's just meant to be a wake-up call. What can you do to change your life to not be a wrestler or a stripper? Because I know I have for... 30 plus years now, broken down my body, killing myself, working harder than anyone else I've worked with for 30 years. And I look at Mickey Rourke in this wrestler movie. It's like, at what point am I going to have my breaking point? Yeah. I'm not going to like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right. On to next week. (laughs) We're going to go a little bit lighter, maybe. I like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> now you just threw a conundrum. <laughs> uh, maybe. She yeah, has uh, been to say. Um, I think if we're going to, you know, we'll keep on this whole life events thing here. And we we both have been wanting to see this series for a while. And I actually, like, uh, <laughs> binged through all three seasons of it uh, just recently. But, uh but we're, we're going to do a review of Ted Lasso. And I think there's a lot of like stuff that you've been covering, at least with your uh, particular smart challenges with like accountability. Uh, I think what we talk, what I talked about here about being a pivot um, and um, having a plan and stuff like that. Uh, I think all that kind of plays in with this, uh, with this series of Ted Lasso as well. Uh, and I think it also, you can look at like, um, and I, I made this comment to you and I think it's uh, very true. This is almost like watching a live version of the book, how to win friends and influence people by, by, yeah. Instead of like being by, uh, 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 Dale Carnegie, it's, it's Ted Lasso <laughs> and he's winning friends and influencing people. And if you look at what he's doing, and how he's going about doing it is very much about what uh, Dale Carnegie talks about in his book about how to win friends and influence people. Um, so it'll be a fun, uh, uh, I think it'll be more lighthearted, hopefully. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is a uh, very entertaining, but yet uh, very impactful uh, three-season uh, TV series. Uh, so that that will be our next week's uh, smart challenge. All right, Ted Lasso, the series, three seasons. We got this.
All right. Uh, lastly, thank you to all of you who uh, stayed with us to the very end. Uh, that may have watched the uh, that watch us on YouTube or Rumble. We greatly appreciate all of you. Uh, as to all of our listeners on the very many different podcast platforms, thank you for listening to us. We also greatly appreciate all of you as well. Please like and share. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe our uh, our podcast. Uh, if you like our content, um, leave some comments down below so that way we can interact with you. Let us know if you agree with us on our tastings. Let us know if you agree or disagree uh, with us on our smart challenges and, uh, and our points of view. Uh, we are both totally open to uh, to your guys' thoughts. You know, I know I'm not always right. I know I'm wrong quite a bit, so I'm okay to the criticism if you guys want to like uh, talk about that as well. Uh, I guess with that, I'll pass over to Jesse to close this out. All right. Remember, please, please, please drink responsibly. Do not drink and drive. Um, and uh, remember, life is great. That does not mean it's going to be easy. Actually, the harder you work sometimes when you have those great moments, they mean that much more. Keep fighting the good fight. And until next week. Scotchman! Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this evening's episode of Scotch Hour. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you have not done so already, please become a Patreon member with memberships starting as low as $1 a month. Thank you, and hopefully you have a wonderful evening.